Well, good morning, Dick. Well, good morning, Larry the House Guy. Where you been? I've been on sabbatical. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I've been so busy doing so many different things. Good, good. I, I do best early in the morning. Most of, you know, get most of my work done early in the morning. So all of a sudden I had some problems trying to make it. And I didn't think, I think maybe you guys could have used a, a week or two with me gone just to, you know, be able to Never. Never. Yeah. But uh, anyway, how are you doing? Doing all right. Doing all right. Good, good. Uh, I got things worked out with um, back at you, and I'm going to be launching an advertising campaign into Orange County, California. Sweet. Uh, for the for the four of us. All right. And uh, basically, it's I, I created and I'm recording five more ads. One is aimed at uh, Portland, one's aimed at Seattle, <laughs> one's, one's aimed at Minneapolis, one's at Chicago, one's at New York. And I might be adding, uh, you know, uh, Rochester, New York to it pretty soon. <laughs> well, you ought to add San Francisco and San Diego as well. Yeah. Well, San Diego, I, uh, I, I attempted to do that last week and uh, there was a mistake on the landing page. So I had to cancel that ad out. I see. But uh, as I did research, the most number of people leaving a certain area in California is from Orange County. Uh, okay. And so I got a, um, a, a population of one and a half million people, which is small. Uh, but I got it with like 15 miles of Orange California. Good morning there, buddy. What's up, Big Dick? How are you, sir? Oh, I love when someone says that. <laughs> <laughs> that is the perfect, that is that is a, a perfect Zoom background. It looks like you are sitting in that office. Well, I am. This, this is my new world headquarters. <laughs> I had to create something because I was interviewed uh, by the Open House show last week and we needed to make a smaller uh, area and I kind of like it too. I, I created this background. I've added the tree to it or the plant and it looks real. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, using that, uh, I recommend that, that uh, Logitech real camera. It's, it's a real winner. It's a not all that expensive, but boy, does it do a great job. Very cool. Is my, is my sign backwards or normal? Normal. It's normal, but you know, okay. maybe you should do it backwards because then it re you know, reflects your personality of being abnormal. There you go. It'll be backwards to you, Larry, just so that you know your hand movements aren't thrown off. That's why. Gotcha. Okay. But it looks good to us. I mean, bald is spelled wrong. Good morning, Robin. Good morning. How are you today? I feel so good I can hardly stand it. <laughs> I'm messing with you, Larry. I was looking at it going, what? <laughs> What's he talking about? Oof. Good morning, Miss Robin. Good morning, Dan. Hello, Wendy McBroom. Hello. <laughs> How is everyone this fine, fine Thursday? Up and out early, cool weather. Oh my God, dogs wasn't loved it. it. Wasn't it nice? Oh, dog walk was amazing for the first time in months. I have to tell you guys something. I took my car and my 2011 Hyundai Sonata to Jim Click. The engine light came on, and I have 130,000 miles in the car. And they said, "Good news for you. Uh, Hyundai has has changed their uh, warranty. You now have an engine for life." And they replaced the whole engine. Got it back yesterday at no cost. They even let me have a rental car for nothing. Oh That's my awesome. gosh, I can't believe that. That's awesome. Teresa, what happened to your face? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> oh no. Teresa, Teresa selected her background and she clicked that I did have a virtual background. I do have a green screen and she clicked herself as the green screen. Okay. <laughs> You look like a ghost. That's oh, funny. that's too funny. <laughs> she she did this. 
<laughs> Whoa. Oh. But what I don't understand as well is the TV in the background of my picture. I know. I didn't click anything. It just came up that way this morning. <laughs> it goes to the machine. <laughs> Makes me laugh. Oh, good morning, Eileen. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. I have a quick question. I have a short answer. Right. Yes is the answer. Okay. Yes, yes is usually the answer. When we're doing a, um, a purchase contract for a condo, um, where it says home warranty, do, do we just process the home warranty? Does 210, is a condo yeah, yeah. considered the same thing yeah. as a house? No, the it's a house is a different. Uh, okay, all right. As you can see, this is the first time I've dealt with a condo, so. Yeah, biggest thing about condo townhome is HOA. You know, it's almost an automatic. Yeah, yeah. And it's usually I've downloaded three hundred dollars a month. Yeah, a month. Yeah, I've downloaded that. So. And that's and then the next thing is figuring out what utilities and and other services are paid for in that HOA payment. In other words, um, in May said it was sewer, water, garbage, covered parking space, common area maintenance, roof tile all that stuff for the 182 a month actually turned out to be a bargain. Yeah, this one includes a lot plus the taxes. So it's there great. You, go. you got it covered. I'm learning about the, the caps and things. And um, on RPR, they have another little section um, for like investors. And I'm learning about this program they have. They give you so many files free and then you have to sign up, but it's a really nice analysis. I guess something what we're going to be talking about Friday with, with the gentleman that's going to do the presentation about investing. And so I've been watching some videos and trying to learn a little bit about that. Well, why don't you explain to us what you've learned so far? What, what is CAP? Well, I haven't got that far yet. Can you please <laughs> enlighten me? I'm trying to learn this program. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> Cap so the rate. cap rate is the capitalization rate, which means the valuation measured used the compared difference in the investment and what you can expect out of in okay. cash flow. Um, yeah. Cap rate is often calculated between the ratio of the net operating expense. So you've got your monthly payment, insurance, taxes, um, servicing fees, if it's like an HOA, then you have a property management, everything that costs to own that property in a year divided by how much you get in rent for that year. Essentially, yeah. essentially gives you a percentage rate of return, right? Yeah, your rate of return. Okay. So that's when you can measure if you're in the yeah. seven, eight, nine percent range or higher, then you're way ahead of most other investment opportunities, the stock market and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, cap rate is, uh, you know, you get to decide whether the property is worth buying or not. Okay. Yeah, Google yeah. defines it as calculating the cap rate is dividing the property's net operating income by the current market value. This ratio is expressed as a percentage and is an estimate for an investor's potential return on a real estate investment. California people are looking for a six plus percent cap rate, and that is all over Tucson. Okay. Yeah, so four to five percent is what they see. Six to seven to eight percent is what their goal is. Ten plus is a gold mine. Because yes. right there, at eight percent, you're beating the average return of this S and P index. And is it better to do a, a projection of like a long term, like a ten year, or or should I do both, like a ten year projection and a a short term, like a two year, just to compare it? Um, most investors are going to look for the short term gain. Okay. Um, the, the long term holdout is only if it's paid off. Um, most investors that I've, I've worked with will buy it, rent it for a few years, either sell it to flip to a bigger home or a bigger property, like a duplex into a fourplex or buy uh -huh. or pay it off and have a full appreciated, you know, property. So isn't there, um, what is it? What, what's the tax thing that investors face after three or five years? Isn't there some like, isn't it some, doesn't that reach a point where the tax base changes or something like that on the income tax? 
called the point of diminishing returns. <laughs> I seem to remember something about that in, in, our, in my class, but I can't remember. Um, when it comes to income tax, it just becomes your tax base has changed based on your, your income. So over time, you're going to accumulate more and more assets that are going to make more and more money. Your tax base is going to change. When you sell a property, you are liable for the tax deferment on it. And that could be what you're thinking about. That's a 1031 exchange when they're selling a property that's worth $200,000 and buying one that's of equal or greater value or a combination of houses, greater or equal value being, being the only way to defer that tax. And you can do that indefinitely upon death. And then that tax burden falls upon your heirs. So if you my, guys have not taken a 1031 class, do so. Very insightful. So my so my two cats would end up paying the bill. Sorry. That's well, just the feeling right there. Yeah. It's got a you know fur balls. Oh, I gotta, Is it oh, aren't I'm, the rules right now that the that the depreciation um goes away after um if it goes to your heirs, doesn't that depreciation get wiped out? Um, I'm not exactly sure the exact timeline, but last I remembered, I know on my, my properties that we can only depreciate it out for five years. You could only show a loss for five years. Um, that may have changed. I got to actually, for my own properties that we're buying now, I got to talk to my tax accountant and see where I can levy that. That's a good question. But the depreciation cannot be pushed out that long. And I know that at some point, the depreciation I didn't know that. I have to talk to my accountant. Holy cow, that's not good. Yeah, because it, it but may it's have good for taxes well. if I don't have to pay them back. Right. So, always refer to but a I, good tax person. Wow, I'm telling my guy today. <laughs> so it matters. We just shake up the tree a little bit. Because I really want to focus on that this next couple of weeks is what kind of conversations we can have with people about buying or selling a house. And like Teresa's got this, this client of hers that she talked to that's not motivated to sell, but motivated to buy. So why don't we turn that into an asset for them? Because a lot of people are afraid to rent their house out because they're like, I don't want to be a landlord. Do you know what it costs for a property manager to manage your property? You are muted, Mr. Larry. Sorry, um, I know that on, on average, well, I don't know what I want to say on average, but um, the, one, of the, one of the rental companies averaged out to about $80 a month. Um, I would say eight to 10% of whatever the monthly rental is, is, is a good, it's a good uh, yeah, it, measurement. Yeah, in percentages, yeah, eight up to, I've seen them as high as 15. Um, that was a good number of years ago when I had my townhouse rented here. Um, but, um, you know, there's, a, was it, uh, I don't even know. I haven't heard the advertising in a while, but the renter's warehouse, um, I, I think that they, they came out to a number or they're flat rated at eight, like $80 a month, which is gold. As far as I'm concerned, if I was renting again for not having to answer the phone at three in the morning. But Dick's right. The average is 10%, which means if you're renting your townhouse out for $2,500 a month, that's 250 bucks a month goes to the property manager. $3,000 a year. Is it worth $3,000 a year if your positive cash flow is $500 a month? Would be to me. This, I'm, I'm trying to change mindsets here. This is, we're not so much scripting on this. Is, this is a scripting in your mind to help you with that idea. If you are positive cash flowing $500 a month, Half of that goes to your property management. You are still netting two fifty a month, three thousand dollars a year. Hopefully, there's not many repairs or needs if it's a nicer place and it moves on. You know, twenty five hundred dollars a month is a pretty hefty sized investment. On top of that, you get the tax savings on that property. Someone else is paying down your mortgage, so you're building equity, and you're realizing a positive cash flow. And hopefully the property is going up and down. And historically, 3% in property values over a 10-year term. So you can talk about that aspect of it, Mr. Teresa, is saying, you know, right now you're buying at the top of the market. That's okay. 
because when you're buying at the top of the market, you're also buying at the bottom of the bank. Even for investors, seeing a 4% rate, 4.5% rate on investors is still worth the money because at 4.5%, if you're, if you're realizing an 8% cap, you're still beating the S&P because you have appreciation on the property, you have tax deferment on the purchase, you have tax sheltering on the investment, and you have a positive cash flow. The hardest part about investing, I'm going to break everybody's mind on this, is just having the initial investment, having the money to put down. You need 20% down for a single family home or 25% down for a resident or a multifamily. That means a $200,000 house, how much money do you need down? You know, I, I have a thought on that too. I mean, if you are buying in a good area, if you're buying a new home, if you have a home warranty, it's so, I mean, I think it's so easy to manage um, your own rental properties. As long as you have good tenants and you're in a good area, I, I just find it so simple. That you're hundred percent right. If you have it set up right, like here's, here's a horror story from my past. When I was 19, my mother and I purchased a 10 unit trailer park, 15% cap, massive cash flow, seventies built, completely degraded, terrible tenants, always needing repairs. I was working full time as an engineer at Raytheon. She was as well. So neither of us had time to manage the property. Didn't even know about property managers. But I can tell you that the two years that I owned that park were the biggest headache that I've ever endured. I didn't realize a single thing out of it, positive cash flow wise, because we were putting the money right back into the park. I was still able to realize the tax savings and didn't pay tax for two years on a $90,000 salary. So tell me that's not worth the investment itself. Even though it was a headache. So I gave my, I effectively gave myself a 30% raise at work because I wasn't paying tax on the money I was earning. I shot myself in the foot when I sold that. When I moved to Denver, I had mm -hmm. sold that property. I had 10 rentals there and two other ones outside of the city. And I sold them all thinking I would never come back to Tucson because my mind was so sheltered in that I had to do it myself and didn't get a property manager. Had I had a property manager, I would have still owned those and those things have been paid off by now. I'd be making $4,000 a month just on that one property. And somebody else can have the headache. Somebody else can do it. I just stroke a check for small repairs here and there. So if, if that's something you want to do, I don't care how young you are. Look at you, McBroom. Or how old you are. It doesn't matter. It's time, it's time to start thinking about longevity here. Your 401ks, I'm sorry, they are not going to support you the rest of your life. IRAs and all that other crap. I, I apologize. I, I'm not relying on any political stance here, but history has proven that the, that the welfare system is getting shut down. And that includes Social Security. So for you to make sure that you have enough money to live the way you want to forever is to have multiple streams of revenue. You have the best position possible, and that's becoming a real estate agent with Keller Williams Southern Arizona that is partnered with Keller Williams International because we have those people out there that are doing this at an extremely high rate and level and are willing to teach not only the secrets, but hold your hand through the process. Dan, yeah, you know about the IRAs, you can do a self-directed IRA and buy real estate and um, you can still leverage inside your IRA as well? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I did not know that. Yeah. So, again, have a conversation with an accountant. That's one of the best things you could possibly do. Yeah. The stock market is so, like, who knows what's going to happen. People can take, I think it's, I just did one. I think, um, I think you have to have 65% down or 60%, and then you can leverage 40%. And the rate's actually even better than an, invest, an investor's rate because they'll only do a 15-year. But, um but it's a pretty, I mean, it's a pretty unique, cool way to go and still get into real estate and have a 401 or self-directed, I guess. That's where it's at. I, I love getting people out of the mindset that I need a job, a J-O-B. That job is an acronym. You know what it stands for? Just when we're broke. High five, Dick. <laughs> so. But well, welcome to real estate, everybody. This is this is a great great time to to start changing it because we are starting to see we are seeing a market shift. We are shifting into a buyer's market here, and we're going to see it come in short order. 
every major election, if you look historically, has slown the market down, we lose momentum, then we have to pick up transitions. And then usually in that, that time is when things shift. We got accelerated in that when it came to COVID. The good thing is, is the gov was like, hey, we need to drop rates. And the banks were like, you're stupid. This is gonna put us into depression. And then they did it anyways. And buyers are like, I can pay more for the house because I have less in in the interest. So everyone is still happy. So the market has still been flooded with these opportunities. And now rates are two and a half, two, three quarters, insanely low rates. And I, I bought my house in April at 299 and that was the lowest rate they've ever seen there. And now I just did a prequal for somebody that's 245. Like, holy crap. You are, you are borrowing money for 30 years, half a percent below the average rate of inflation. Amazing. A 70 year trend. Now, what are we gonna see? We're gonna see that rectified. We're gonna see a market adjustment. We're gonna see things change. And that's gonna give you, your, your investors and the people you talk to the opportunity to buy up houses, the opportunity to buy properties. It may not be a $90,000, $100,000 swing. It might be a $10,000 swing or a $15,000 swing. I'm sure it'll be rectified with, when it comes to the, the interest rates, but that gives the opportunity for you to have a conversation now. This is the scripting part and saying, what are you going to do with your retirement? What are you going to do with the equity in your home? Why wouldn't you use the equity to help you build more cash flow and build more equity in, in long term? Robin, what if I told you you could sell your home, pay off all your debts, reduce your monthly output, still buy the house that you want that's bigger, better, in a nicer neighborhood and have the money left over to go buy an investment property? Sounds like a no-brainer. Why wouldn't I? Who wouldn't take that? Do not use the name, use the term no-brainer. It's a brainer. It's a brainer. It's a brainer. It makes brainer. a lot of sense. Yes, it makes that's, a lot of sense. We can start thinking about that. When you talk to people, talk to your friends and stuff like that, you'll know where they live. Get their address. If you don't have their address, you're failing already. There's a little thing we like to call as the uh, assessor's records. If you know their last name and you know the rough neighborhood they live in, you can find their address. You can be that creepy stalker realtor because that's what we're good at. We're finding information. And you can put them on a neighborhood drip. You can put them on that information right away. Every one of my PC agents got a random ass text and email from me yesterday, didn't you? Yeah, guess what? I sent out 48 emails and texts and I didn't have to do anything. That's a smart plan. I'm trying it out because I'm building them because I'm gonna learn how to use them so that you can benefit from my knowledge as well. You can do the same thing. Every week, Eric Erickson sends out an email to 10,000 people in his database or whatever it is that says the deal of the week, you can buy this house, $180,000, 20% down. This is what your, your mortgage would be at four and a half, five percent This is what your anticipated rent would be. This is what the cap rate is. This is what your cash flow would be. Where do you think he gets most of his business? I just saw Teresa's brow for hours. She's like, oh, dang, I can do that. So once you understand the mathematics behind it, which is very simple, what my payment is, what the insurance is gonna be for the year, what the rent should be, all that combined. So what you make versus what you spend, net income versus investment, cap rate, anything over 6%, 6 7% is gonna be attractive to a California East. It's gonna be very attractive to a New York buyer. It's gonna be super attractive to a Florida buyer. I have seen caps in the eight, nine, 10% here lately, even when people are selling houses at top of market. Someone will ask you, hey, find me a good deal. Define good deal, Larry. You're something muted. with something with 8% cash flow. Yeah. Right. When you hear it's, a good it's, deal, what do you think? It's not the price of the house or what have you. It is the cap rate. It could be, like you said, a trailer park, or it could be something in the foothills. Um, but in real estate, it doesn't matter where it is as long as it will rent. One of the leaders in this company just rented a house, a $420,000 house. He's paying just under $5,000 a month for rent. The mortgage on a $450,000 house is just over $2,300 a month. That's a good deal. Mm -hmm. So when someone says, find me a good deal, now we need to know the mathematics behind it. Robin, what's a good deal? 
Something that's going to have a positive cash flow. Okay. What if I'm not going to rent it out? Then something that you're going to build equity with. Heck, we make it even simpler. What's a good deal to you? Find me a good deal. That's a great question. What do you consider a good deal? You know what a good deal is and people talk about sales prices or well, is price under market? That means it's a house nobody wanted to buy. Find me a good deal. Okay, what do you define as a good deal? I want a house that's 10 to $15,000 under market. Okay, great. Are you willing to put 20 grand into it? Well, what do you mean? Well, usually houses that are priced 10 to $15,000 under market are houses nobody wants. And that's the reality of it. Where there's too many damn HGTV buyers out there that think a good deal is buying a house under market. God, I watched Sell Selling Sunset this last couple of days. Heather watched it for the drama. I watched it for the real estate and the negotiation. There were so many things in that show that I absolutely despise and how they handled it. And they're making millions of dollars. And every bit of it, I'm looking at and going, this is nuts. This is setting expectations out there that are not realistic. You don't, Dan. You guys watch it, you'll see what I mean. Watch it from my brain. Think, how would Dan see this? Okay. Hey, Dan, uh, one of the things when you look at a good deal or what is a good deal, you have to know your audience. Right. A good deal from someone from California versus someone from uh, Marana or from uh, Portland, whatever. Hey, I'm it from depends Marana. what oh, yeah. they're motivating. Them. And I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, why do, why do I not take the Statue of Liberty and Photoshop it on top of a mountain and tell everybody from all these places, come, come my poor people, come to the land of milk and money. Because the good deal is almost any house or any property sold in Tucson today, because we have great deals. We have, we have fantastic deals. I, think we have fantastic. Right. I love that you said that, know your audience. Did yeah. you know that a, a typical buyer or a Valley client, you know that, that that clientele, right? The highbrow drives a Mercedes, $400,000 house in the hill. That same house in California, two and a half, $3 million. So they sell that house in California. They're realizing 10%. How much are they walking away from? A $250,000, $300,000 cash. So a good deal to them is they come to Tucson and they put half down on that new house and their payments now only $1,500 a month versus 7,000. That's why we are in a different market space. The people locally, and I hate to say this, my Moranians, me, myself, and I look at the fact that my neighbor's house just sold for 275. I bought my house four months ago for 250. My house is bigger and more remodeled now. So I'm like, holy shit. Like, I'm glad I bought it now. And then the guy that bought the house, guess where he's from? California. He's from San Francisco. Yeah. He just sold his two bedroom condo for $2 million. He paid cash and he's got a brand new Mercedes sitting in the driveway. I can tell you it's probably the only Mercedes in my entire neighborhood. Yeah. And he doesn't even have a garage. Like think about this people. We have money coming this way. Let's take people from being just consumers and turn them into investors. Can I just share one story? A year ago this month, uh, it hit the national news, the lowest price house on the multi-list in, in San Francisco was a 790 foot square, square foot home on an 850 square foot lot, one bedroom, no parking, no garage, and they reduced the price from 675 to 650. It became the lowest price. I took that price, and I compared it to our MLS last year at the same time, we had over 3,000 homes that fit into the $500,000 to $600,000 range. And at the price, uh, I could got them a four acre uh, ranch, mountain view with a swimming pool and guest house, uh, like 3,500 square foot house, a thousand square foot uh, guest house for five hundred ninety thousand dollars. It was gorgeous. 
where would you rather live? Anybody who wants that study, I'll send it to them. Just send me an email or text me and I'll send it to you because it'll blow your mind. But that's how bad California is. And those poor people are refugees. We need to open our arms, vet them first, make sure that they are worthy to come to the land of milk and money and uh, find them a home. I love it. Now we've got to miss you, Dick. Thank you for coming on. Well, I'm sorry I was gone, but I was telling Larry earlier, I was on a sabbatical and I uh, had a lot of things I'm working on right now. And, uh, you know, writing my uh, life story and doing, uh, doing uh, videos for the, for the, uh, for the uh, Vatican. So uh, you're, you're writing your life story? Oh, I, yeah, yeah. Do you have enough paper? Well, it's, you know, it, I, I, the, title, the title of my biography is My Brother Was an Only Child. Yeah. <laughs> History of the world through the eyes of Dick Nichols. So, well, guys, I want to say thank you for that. You know, let me rant a little bit on the, the investment side of things. I got a text message from Teresa last night. that was would kind of insightful. She's like, how do I handle the, the investor buyer? And what did I say, Teresa? Tell me I can do this. So yeah, I'm, girl. I'm, I'm researching and I am going to do this. So, and so, I'm hoping he won't know this is my first investor consultation. So this is now your second because you've talked to me. Yeah. And you talked to Sherry and Larry and Dick. Yeah. Got everybody. So Melissa and, and <laughs> all these people. I want you to practice these things. Talk this. You, your first interaction with that client should not be the first time you've been doing that presentation. Call a friend. Hey, you got 30 minutes. Can we jump on a Zoom call? Can we do this back and forth? Scripts and role play is imperative to your life. We talk about this all the time. I, I know I sound very scripted. How do you think I sound very scripted? I'm practice. By having practice scripts. Tons of practice. Oh, I mean, I you know. The other day, they're like, wow, you're very polished. <laughs> I, you know, it just kills me every time Josh Berkeley works into, walks into a room. And he says people start asking him questions. And it is the most eye-opening, eye-popping thing to witness. Josh Berkeley is the walking script. Yeah, ever, and, any and every script ever produced by Keller Williams is in his head and he recites it as naturally and as coachingly, if you will, as you can imagine. What I love listening to Josh Bershley in conversation. Well, you know, if you think of real estate as being an art form, like music, the question always was, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And it's practice, practice, practice. So if you want to be at the top level of your artistry as a realtor, how do you get there? Practice, practice, practice. And do not make yourself a secret agent. No. I mean, not the whole world knows about you. And Keller Williams is the company, the brokerage, that allows you to brand yourself and gives you every resource in the world to do that. Look at big Dan Caldwell. I mean, this guy is bigger than the mountains. Hold on. I really am. Yes. And do not tell him what you called me earlier. <laughs> I love that. Where'd you get that at? Oh, a good friend of mine sent it. An amazing, amazing person. Uh, blessed is he who comes to the guru. I have a quick question, a follow-up about investors. So... You have the regular investors, and then you have the flippers. So the flippers want a fast return, obviously, and they want something they can come in, renovate a little bit, and put on the market. Their rate of return, are they looking for something like, I don't know, 10, 20%, or is it just range? Yeah. 10 or 20 grand. 10 or 20 grand. Investment, yeah. They're looking to make 10 or 20 grand per house. They're not looking to make 50, 60. If they can, that's a steal. But if they can make 10, 20 grand on a house after all fees are done, then mm -hmm. it's a great deal. If you can find them a house that's priced decently, that needs some work, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for they're looking for something they can throw some money at, turn it around, and and then put it something great. Okay. Go up to Phoenix and go in the shopping 
lot, a shopping uh, a parking lot of say Ikea and every contractor you see who's there looking at cabin tree, you walk up to them and hand them your card because you can say, hey, I'll find your house. You can just use Ikea and, and fix it up and flip it. There you go. I love it. I love that idea. Go to Ikea and hand out business cards. Whoo. Go look at some Swedish made designs and hand out your cards. That sounds like a sweet idea to me. Yeah. Yeah, make sure you get their cards too so you can put them on your on your command and go after the people. Build your database. So four things you should be doing every day. What are they? Lead gen number one. <laughs> so adding people to your database, calling people from your database, sending cards to people from your database, and viewing homes. Well, I know, I know three. Eat, uh, say eat, drink, and be merry. What's the fourth one? Oh, to your database. Yeah, Mary's not on this call. She's still yeah. working. So. Awesome, guys. Well, it's three minutes past the time frame here. Go out there, go forth, do something great. If you are not going to do the class tomorrow at 11 o'clock, I highly recommend you change your mind. It's going to be some great stuff. Steve Chater talking about how to turn your clients into investors so that you can create great wealth through helping others create great wealth. It is not what we do. It is what we do for others that makes us the greatness that we are. So please go out there, change somebody's life today, and it can be as simple as a smile. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks. Bye, guys.